The type of the harvest in the 70th week of Daniel 9.27, 27 AD to 34 AD, tells the story of the soul harvest in the end of the world. In the type, the wave sheaf and the first fruits, the 120 and the 3,000 respectively, were disclosed to view at and after the special resurrection in the last of the 70 weeks. Two prophets, John the Baptist and Jesus, started the harvest at the Feast of Tabernacles, A.D. 27. The death of Stephen ended it at the Feast of Tabernacles, A.D. 34. All were martyrs who gave their lives that others might be saved. The martyrs from righteous Abel to the time of John the Baptist were raised when the Messiah arose and joined in maturing the first fruit harvest, the 120, brought to view on the day of Pentecost, 31 AD, when the 3,000 were added. The first of the first fruits, Exodus 19, the wave sheaf, and the last of the first fruits, the 120 and the 3,000, were offered at two different times. The wave sheaf on the morrow after the seventh day Sabbath, during the Passover week, the 120 and 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. The wave sheaf was translated 10 days before Pentecost to prepare for the inauguration of their great high priest in his mediatorial kingdom. This was signalized on earth by the outpouring of the Spirit, as tongues of fire, on the heads of the 120. The 3,000 were made manifest on the same day, Pentecost, as a result of Peter's sermon at the third hour, and offered through the Spirit on earth. Those resurrected with the Messiah were inaugurated into their mediatorial kingdom in heaven to start their work in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary in the daily administration for those to be gathered in the gospel harvest, including those at the end of the world. After the day of Pentecost, a great multitude of second fruits from the Jewish nation were gathered in by the Spirit-filled 120 and 3,000 souls brought to view as the result of one sermon by the Apostle Peter. As in the natural harvest of grains and fruits, so it is in the spiritual. All are not harvested at the same time. The type teaches the truth of the spiritual soul harvest. First, John the Baptist announced the Messiah who is revealed as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. John witnessed the crowning of the Messiah at the descent of the dove, as a beam of pure light rested upon his head, crowned him for his ministry of three and a half years to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was the wave sheaf foretokened by the grain offering conducted for over a thousand years by the Jewish nation in the tabernacle service of the earthly sanctuary. He, one person, represented the wave sheaf, a multitude of fruits to be offered on Sunday the morrow after the Sabbath, Leviticus 23.11, at Passover 31 AD. This multitude was not known as part of the harvest ministry until their resurrection. They prefigured the martyrs from the stoning of Stephen to the future special resurrection. During the typical harvest to the Jewish nation, the house of God, 1 Peter 4.17, the wave sheaf, Messiah, as one person, the bridegroom, started the harvest at the Feast of Tabernacles on the 16th day of the 7th month, 27 AD. In the three and a half years of his ministry, the 12 and the 70 were brought to view before Pentecost when they, as part of the 120 first fruits, were empowered to reveal the additional 3,000 first fruits at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. This army of spirit-filled believers went out and gathered a great multitude from the Jewish nation for nearly three and a half years until the Feast of Tabernacles, A.D. 31. It was afterward, after A.D. 31, that these consecrated believers, the 120, the 3,000, and a multitude of ministers went to the Gentiles all over the then-known world. As we take another look at the harvest types pictured in the seven years of judgment, 27 AD to 34 AD, to the Jewish nation, a much larger number of fruits are in evidence than has been previously revealed. A simple diagram furnishes ample proof of the different sections of the total harvest that started in 27 AD, and aside from temporary interruptions, continues to the close of probation. The resurrected multitude of captives pointed forward primarily to another great multitude, second fruits, from Pentecost 31 AD to the Feast of Tabernacles 34 AD, 
from every kindred, tongue, and nation, and secondarily, to a great multitude in the end of the world before the second coming, besides their work in bringing to maturity the 120 first fruits with the 3,000. These represented two tribe Judah and the ten tribe Israel from 153 nations present in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost on the day the first fruit offering of two wave loaves for Israel and Judah. Plainly is seen the impossibility of all twelve tribes being fully represented by 120 people, mainly from Judah, living in Jerusalem at the time of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the seventy weeks. Two parts of the wave sheaf. 1. The first of the first fruits, the wave sheaf. Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, chapter 34, verse 26, chapter 23, verse 10, and Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. It's comprised of two parts, the Messiah and an unnumbered multitude of wave sheaf offered during the Passover week. Bear in mind that it was at the Feast of Tabernacles that Messiah, the antitypical wave sheaf, was anointed by the Holy Spirit for his ministry of three and a half years for the first fruits of the harvest to the Jewish nation, the 120. Therefore, it is plain to see that according to the type, it is the wave sheaf who gather the antitypical first fruits, the 144,000, in the judgment of the living at the end of the world. The first part of the typical first fruit harvest, the 120, was conducted by Christ and the resurrected wave sheaf, the mysterious hidden ministry who received eternal life forevermore without a book judgment before the wave loaves were matured. The second part of the first fruits, the 3,000, were harvested by Peter and the spirit filled disciples, completing the first fruit harvest. Quote, those who arose with Christ on the 18th day of the first month were immortalized and received into heaven as the antitypical sheaf, pointing to the ingathering of the fruits that shall never die in the final harvest. Their resurrection from the dead signified the beginning of the first fruit harvest of the 120 disciples who were to die and be resurrected. End quote. Thus, in the final harvest, the 144,000 will be revealed after the special resurrection. Tract 3, page 84, paragraph 3. Quote, As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. The earthquake at his death had rent open the graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. They were those who had been co-laborers with God, and who at the cost of their lives, martyrs, had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised from the dead. End quote. Desire of Ages, page 786, paragraph 1. Quote, and since the wave sheaf was a figure of one, Christ, and two, of those who rose with him as the first of the first fruits of the dead, hence the wave loaves were a figure of the spirit filled disciples who were the full complement of the first fruits of the dead and who were gathered in after the special resurrection, end quote. Track 3, page 80. Quote, As he ascended after forty days, he led the way, and the multitude of captives set free at his resurrection followed, end quote. Desire of Ages, page 833. Quote, He points to the tokens of his triumph. He presents to God the wave sheaf, those who raised with him as representatives of that great multitude who shall come forth from the grave at his second coming. End quote. Desire of Ages, page 834. Quote, so Christ, the first fruits, represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. End quote. Desire of Ages, page 786. Put another way, quote, the wave sheaf of both the dead and the living Tract 3, page 83, now represent the total harvest, those numbered and those unnumbered, for they, quote, must have a double application, each to the dead and to the living, together comprising the total fruits of the antitypical harvest, end quote. Therefore, we must first see a great multitude of living wave sheaf perfected in the final harvest for the living. 
the resurrection is very positive testimony that the first fruits, the 120 of them that slept, did not ripen, become fully converted, until after the special resurrection. Quote, the 40 days of Christ's ministry on earth after his resurrection was the time in which the first fruits were gathered in. Tract 3, page 84 and 85. Read all of page 82 to 87 in review. Quote, the wave sheaf and the wave loaves must have a double application, each to the dead and to the living, together comprising the total fruits of the antitypical harvest. End quote. Tract 3, page 83. Quote, Therefore, I say to those thinking to gather the first fruit harvest, the 140,000, before the special resurrection, Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, page 44 and 45, of the dead from A.D. 31 to the present, and the living wave sheaf from death in trespasses and sin, cease to wonder why the 140,000 have not been brought forth. The type tells us why. The wave sheaf must first be gathered from all nations and revealed. Then the first fruits can be manifested on the antitypical day of Pentecost, and with power bring the second fruits from the church in a clean vessel as in the apostolic type. Quote, the 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost being the gospel's first fruits of the dead, it follows that the great multitude added to the church daily thereafter, after the day of Pentecost, naturally were the gospel's second fruits of the dead. End quote. Notice the second fruits, a multitude, were gathered from the Jewish nation, church, until A.D. 34. They were not Gentiles. Tract 3, page 86, paragraph 3. Naturally, then, Revelation 7, 9 has its first application to the church, then to the world, Gentiles, to the wave sheaf first. Quote, Mark carefully that this great multitude with palms stood before the Merkaba throne, not bodily, but figuratively only. End quote. Track 3, page 87. The type of the harvest shows four divisions of the first fruits. One, the Messiah, prophet. Two, first of the first fruits. Three, the first fruits. Four, the second part of the first fruits. The wave sheaf was inaugurated in their mediatorial kingdom with their great high priest at Pentecost, a double ceremony in heaven and on earth, 31 AD. It was then that the first fruits, 120, received the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire at the third hour on the day of Pentecost, and the 3,000 were offered by the apostolic priesthood as the second part of the first fruit harvest of souls. Read Acts 2. After Pentecost, the day of the first fruit offering, they went out only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel daily, and gathered a great multitude of second fruits for nearly three and a half years until 34 AD. Then, and then only, did they turn to the Gentiles and gather another great multitude of second fruits. This, friend, is the only type of a harvest in the scriptures that we have as a pattern for the final harvest in the house of God in our day. Therefore, we can now see how restricted our vision has been of the greatness of the harvest ordained from the foundation of the world. Also, why the harvest has been said to be the most mystified subject in the Bible. Summary Outline of the Harvest for the Children of Israel Let it be remembered that the first fruits were not revealed until the day of the first fruit offering, Pentecost. It was on this day that Jews from 153 nations were present to hear the first sermon given by Peter which yielded an immediate first fruit harvest of 3,000 souls. Hence, the priesthood in two parts in heaven, Christ and the multitude, on the day of Pentecost, and the priesthood, 120 and 3,000, in two parts on earth, at the same hour on the same day. The Merkaba, a signal fire of both the heavenly and earthly priesthood's inauguration into their mediatorial kingdom, in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, the holy place, 
and on earth. As one puts the prophetic magnifying glass on the subject of the harvest, judgment, in the house of God, he is amazed at the former blindness that has obscured the manifold mercies of God, judge of quick and the dead. The magnitude of the souls to be rescued from among the tares in the end of the world's harvest for the church and the world is almost incomprehensible for the average mind unaccustomed to large thinking. 1. First of the first fruits, the wave sheaf, an unnumbered multitude plus one, two parts. Their ministry started at two different times, Feast of Tabernacles and Passover, from all nations and kindreds and tongues, martyrs, who gave their lives for the truth, from all ages beginning with righteous Abel. Desire of Ages, page 786. 2. The First Fruits Two numbered companies, their ministry started on the same day. Wave loaves, Judah and Israel, the 120 and the 3,000, two tribes and ten tribes, brought to view on the day of Pentecost. Two numbered companies at the third hour. Acts chapter 2, verse 5, 15, and 41. The same day, Pentecost. A numbered company of disciples and believers. 120. Another numbered company from Israel, 3,000, not Gentiles from every nation under heaven dwelling at Jerusalem. Being the second part of the first fruits, they became an earnest or surety of the second fruit harvest, an unnumbered company from all nations which were to be gathered daily after the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, to A.D. 34. The wave sheaf grain was barley. The very first ripe heads were waved by the priest at Passover as a signal that the grain harvest was to begin, and fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, the thank offering to wave loaves, the first fruits of wheat, were offered. We can be sure that the rest of the barley fields were not left unharvested, and that the grain was gathered and preserved during the fifty days before Pentecost. This furnishes a type of for the gathering of a living first and second fruits of barley. Both the wave sheaf and wave loaves were the thank offering for the first fruits. Quote, one, the wave sheaf, barley, was dedicated at the beginning of the harvest, the other, wave loaves, wheat, at the completion of it. Track 3, page 78. The resurrection of the wave sheaf, barley, of the dead at Passover AD 31, proves that they were offered while the wheat, wave loaves, were ripening during the forty days before Pentecost. This was a symbol of the first fruit soul harvest from Passover to Pentecost from the Jewish nation. The wave sheaf came forth and gathered the first fruit harvest, taught the truth of the special resurrection, and matured the hundred and twenty, the first part of the first fruits who were disclosed to view with the three thousand on the day of Pentecost. The Second Fruits An unnumbered company of Israelites from all nations gathered daily for three and a half years by the Spirit-filled 120 and the 3,000 revealed on the day of Pentecost, the time of the first fruits. The great multitude of second fruits were represented at the Feast of Tabernacles at the end of the seven years of Daniel 9, 27, at the completion of the total harvest for the Jewish nation, A.D. 34. This multitude included all the fruits gathered from the twelve tribes of Israel, an earnest of the great multitude of Gentiles to be gathered after the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, after A.D. 34. Conclusion Revelation chapters 7 and 14 represent a complete picture in miniature of the harvest judgment as it applies first to the remnant church, with all her fruits, wave sheaf, wave loaves, and a multitude of second fruits. Shepherd's Rod, Volume 2, page 146. Then, the same picture is repeated as it applies to the world on a much greater scale. The harvest judgment to the church is an entirely separate work from that in the world. Therefore, as the groups of individuals find their place in each section of the harvest fruits, they must be fitted to qualify and occupy their proper position as wave sheaf, wave loaves, 
or part of the great multitude of second fruits in the harvest, each in their time and place. As the prophecies of spiritual and literal Israel merge and become one, so also do the earthly and heavenly family merge and act as one. That is, we have the church on earth and the church in heaven acting as one, God's will in heaven done in earth. Matthew 16, 19. Thus we see the spiritual application of the prophecies concerning Israel applied to the church of God on earth merging and becoming literally fulfilled in the actual lineage descendants of the twelve tribes restored to their own land after many days, years. Hosea chapter 3 verse 4 and 5 of sojourning among the nations of their captivity. Quote, For his own wise purpose, the Lord veils spiritual truths in figures and symbols. In parables and comparisons, he found the best method of communicating divine truth. End quote. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 236. Quote, the chief purpose of teaching by parables is that the truth may be revealed to God's children and at the same time concealed from his enemies. Since many of the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel were written for a latter-day fulfillment and only initially for the children of Israel and Judah at the time they were written, they are to be understood by the people of today, the day the prophecies are unsealed. What the Lord purposed to do with Israel of old, he will accomplish with his church on earth. Two Great Eagles The prophecy of Ezekiel 17 is one of the most outstanding ones in its latter-day application of the return of the children of Israel to their own land inheritance in Palestine. This riddle parable reveals the hidden truth to the elect but has concealed it from the devils and his representatives. This allegorical representation of something which is real in its relation to human life and action is represented by something real in nature. Trees, branches, eagles, great waters, a spreading vine, seed, twigs, etc. We are to keep in mind that this riddle by Ezekiel was put forth principally unto the house of Israel, the ten tribes. In its primary application, the prophecy pertaining to an actual branch of two-tribe Judah being taken as depicted by the first great eagle out of his own land, Lebanon, royal house in Palestine, and carried into some other land, so the eagle must represent a mode of transportation to another land of a very small remnant of Judah. The young twigs, sons of royalty, were set in a city of merchants in a land of traffic. He also took the seed, people of the land, predominantly ten tribes, and planted it in another land, the same land, in a fruitful field by great waters, and it grew and became a spreading vine, branched out. Genesis 49.22 As the scripture says, quote, There was another great eagle, end quote who watered it in the furrows of her plantation. He came to the same place of great soil by great waters as the first great eagle who brought the royal sons. With the coming of the second great eagle, or means of transportation, one would assume that a personage of importance would be transported to join one of the royal line of the first eagle. The expression, quote, Behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him, End quote, indicates the passenger to be a woman whose desire was toward the one who preceded her into the same land. This union with the goodly vine of low stature bore fruit offspring. The type. According to the prophecy, the seed of David, son of Pharaoh's line of Judah, was to be planted again to take root and bear fruit. The antitype. In the spiritual realm, the application of this prophecy had its fulfillment when the two personages involved in the prophecies of Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, the branch he, and Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16, the branch she, 
join together to effect a return of the exiles, the twelve tribes of Israel, back to their own land. This project is still in process and shall be accomplished on time. In the literal realm, the prophecy of Ezekiel 17 points to the sifting of Israel and Judah throughout the nations of the world to fulfill the prophecies of Genesis 48 and 49, to bring forth a great multitude as the sand of the sea for number. Genesis 48, verse 4, 5, 16, and 19. The two great eagles symbolized the means of transportation of the children of Israel to the land of their dispersion through the prophetic voice, prophet, the sure word of prophecy, the Merkabah. The name of the tribe of Dan is linked with Joseph, ten tribes, and with Benjamin, the three sons of Rachel, in Ezekiel 48, verse 32, where he receives the first portion of the land in the north. Revelation chapter 21, 12, marginal reference, identifies the heavenly gates of the twelve tribes in the temple with the earthly new division of the land in Ezekiel 48. As Dan shall judge his people, as one of the tribes of Israel, and as Dan abode in ships, it would not be too far-fetched to conclude that Dan furnished and was that means of transporting the exiles to another land as a judgment of God upon them because of their sins. Dan's original possession included the seacoast of Palestine and the port of Tyre was the entry to take the cedars of Lebanon to make mass for their ships. Note, the cedars of Lebanon are a symbol of royalty. The Merkaba, a means of transport for the children of Israel. The standard of the tribe of Dan was the eagle, king of birds, and they are reported to have made great carved eagles with wings outstretched as figureheads on the bows of their vessels. Two, the long sails resembled wings of the wind, or birds flying through the waters as do eagles in the air. Division in Judah the tribe of Judah was divided into two royal lines when twins, Perez and Zerah, were born to Tamar. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, and his sons from Perez, a breach, the firstborn twin, were all destroyed in the Babylonian captivity. Quote, the highest branch of the cedar, end quote, was cast down, Zedekiah. The low tree leader, the second-born twin of Judah, Zerah, seed, was taken to a land of traffic with the ten tribes and preserved to carry on the royal ruling line in the lands of the Gentiles. Only one or two of King Zedekiah's daughters escaped with Jeremiah to Egypt and back to Israel, then to another land of exile. Detailed explanation in part two. Quote, Released from prison by the Babylonian officers, the prophet Jeremiah chose to cast his lot with the feeble remnant, certain poor of the land, left by the Chaldeans to be vine dressers and husbandmen. Go ye not into Egypt, he pleaded. The inspired counsel was not heeded, and all the remnant of Judah took flight into Egypt. They obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they even to Tophenes. A small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah, he declared and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand, mine or theirs. End quote. Prophets and Kings, page 460 and 461, as quoted in Sabbath School Lesson, January 24, 1970, on Ezekiel 17, B. L. Roden. Quote, Some of these chapters, Isaiah 12, 13, and 14, contain prophecies which are illustrated by certain experiences of ancient Israel and nations which at some time were to be repeated. End quote. 12 Symbolic Code, number 1, page 5. At the time of the Reformation in Europe, and in Germany particularly, evidences began to surface as to the identity of the twelve tribes as represented in the Apostolic Church, taken captive by the Romans and absorbed into their economy. 
The voice of Luther broke the power of Rome in the Dark Ages, and the state of Germany officially recognized the work of the Reformation in 1555. The next man on the scene of action, Luther's contemporary, was John Knox, a Scottish reformer who was instrumental in gaining state recognition for the Reformation in Scotland in 1560. With the appearance of these two men and those who followed, Assyria, ten tribe Israel, the Protestant nations, England, Scotland, Ireland, and the Scandinavian countries, completely broke up the church-state confederacy of the Middle Ages. Tract 14, page 34. Quote, While the prophecy of the 430 years of Ezekiel 4 finds its beginning with the Reformation by Luther and others, Knox, etc., the lesson is for this time and the people of this age, Never before has this prophecy been understood, and until now no one has ever received much from it. But when the time is fulfilled, God makes it known. End quote. Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, page 127 and 128. Quote, According to the days, years, of the coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. End quote. Micah chapter 7, verse 15. Quote, now the sojourning of the children of Israel, who dwelt in Egypt, was four hundred and thirty years. End quote. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 and 41. Quote, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law which was four hundred and thirty years after coming out of Egypt, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. End quote. Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Read verse 16. That is, the covenant promises are yet to meet their fulfillment. All Israel is yet to possess the land promised to Abraham and his seed, Palestine. Luther, being a type of Abraham with a message of justification by faith, was a type of another messenger to announce the latter-day church-state confederacy and the one to break it, and deliver Israel into their own land from whence they have so long been absent. As to the 430 years applied to the Reformation under Luther and others, we look at the date of its recognition in the type by the state of Germany in 1555 and add 430 years, which brings us to 1985, an indication of recognition for a Reformation in our day. Likewise, we may add 430 years to 1560, the date Knox's revival by the Spirit was accepted in Scotland, which brings us to 1990, the long-hoped-for recognition of the latter-day message of reformation by the Holy Spirit to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the twelve-star-crowned woman in heaven, Revelation 12. In 1844, another movement to reassemble the twelve tribes and take them back to their own land arose. In another application of the prophecy of Ezekiel 17, the first great eagle who came brought to view the woman in a land of traffic, USA, with a crown of twelve stars symbolizing the twelve tribes of Israel during the judgment of the dead. Soon, a second great eagle came and joined her in her work to restore the tribes to their inheritance, announcing the judgment of the living, 1930-1955. The thread of a complete circle covering the dispersion of the twelve tribes from their own land to the nations of their exile and back home will be set in more clear detail in the second part of this issue.